I'd like to start off um, by welcoming our panelists to the stage and introduce Lori Blank, um, Emory Law Professor, who's going to be serving as the moderator of this panel. She's going to introduce the panelists in depth. Each panelist is going to speak for about 15, 20 minutes or so um, on their own, and then there's going to be a series of questions uh, from the moderator to the panel as a whole, and towards the end, we'll open it up for y'all's questions again, just like after the keynote. So thank you again for being here, and I am going to turn it over to Lori. policy, how can international law frameworks better assist when disasters strike? Um, we're very pleased and honored to have three wonderful panelists here with us. What I'm going to do is just give a very brief introduction to, um, for each of them, and then that way we can just proceed with the remarks without interruption after that. Um, do we have an order, Mindy? Do we have an order? Okay. Okay, so first we have Elise Moschini, who is the Senior Humanitarian Affairs Delegate to the International Federation of Red Cross and Red Crescent Societies Delegation to the United Nations in New York. She represents the IFRC at the UN and engages in diplomacy on humanitarian issues with UN member states, the UN Secretariat and other humanitarian partners. She also worked in the legal department at the IFRC for the past five years in Geneva and in the field. And she is going to um, uh, go first on our panel. Our second speaker will be Dean Jim Chen from the University of Louisville. And he is the author of Disaster Law and Policy, which is the first uh, case book out on uh, the legal issues surrounding natural disasters. His work covers a whole range of topics, but we're thrilled to have him here in particular for his expertise on uh, disaster law and uh, natural disaster relief. We're also very happy to have him here because he is one of the Emory family, having received his BA and his MA from Emory before going on to his law degree at Harvard and then clerking at the Supreme Court. Our last speaker is Sophie Smith, who actually wins the Long Distance Award originally, coming all the way from Ireland. Uh, she's now an Associate Professor of Law at Beasley School of Law at Temple University where she teaches international financial law, development law, and policy and contracts. In particular, before going to Temple Law School, she was a senior counsel in the legal vice presidency of the World Bank, where she had a wide-ranging practice in the field of international finance and also served as a visiting professor of international financial law at Washington College of Law, American University. Without further ado, I'll let us move on to the substance of the panel. And um, Elise, if you would go ahead and start. OK, so first, thank you, Professor Blink, for your introductions. And just to say, I'm really pleased to be here. Thanks to the members of the journal for inviting IFRC to participate in this symposium. It's, for us, a really unique opportunity to interact with different experts from very different perspectives and to share what we've been contributing to the field of disaster response law over the last several years. So just to, to give a bit of background first, I mean, the, the International Federation, IFRC, we, we trace our history in general back to the very origins of humanitarianism, but we've been engaged specifically in the, the practice and the study of disaster response since our founding at the, the beginning of the 1900s. And through a specific dedicated program in disaster response law, we've been promoting legal preparedness for disaster response for the past decade. In my presentation this morning, I'd like to first describe our engagement, IFRC's engagement in the field of international disaster response and the dedicated program that we have for promoting preparedness. I'd like to provide a snapshot of the existing international legal framework and some of the common pr problems that we see in international disaster response, and then conclude by detailing some of the very specific advances that we have made in this field. So first then, um, as the relative sort of practitioner on, on this panel, which will deal with more of the sort of policy frameworks, I just want to start by illustrating a bit for you more the, the disaster context. I know Paul, in, in his initial 
presentation did a good job of illustrating Haiti specifically. And so just to give you a, a different view on it, we'll come to, to a different disaster here. So most of you will recall very, very clearly the, the images of devastation caused by the 2004 Indian Ocean tsunami. And more than six years later, those images are, are still etched, at least in my mind, and I'm sure they are for many of you as well. Um, not only for the devastation itself, but for the overwhelming response that was generated after the disaster. There's still what we think of as the go-to images for mega disasters. And I think that's really for very good reason, because in many ways, the 2004 Indian Ocean tsunami was a turning point in international disaster response. So with the aid of technology here, I'm going to give you a short video clip. So we'll just take out that. Natural disasters are becoming more frequent and more violent all over the world. But nowhere are they more ferocious than in Asia Pacific. Good legislation can help communities become less vulnerable to disasters. It can strengthen their ability to deal with the hazards they face and it can smooth the path of humanitarian aid. After the 2004 Indian Ocean tsunami, international help, a massive amount of international help, was critical to saving lives and restoring dignity. But Indonesia's laws were not yet ready. The tsunami experience opened our eyes on huge humanitarian works that we need to deal with. It broke hundreds of players or organizations entering the province or country. We need to have clear arrangements for them to be able to work and effectively deliver humanitarian aids. Visa delays, customs problems, communities become less vulnerable to disasters. It can strengthen their ability to deal with the hazards they face, and it can smooth the path of humanitarian aid. All right. So that's just to give you a, a quick visual there. My own experience, actually, after the tsunami was as IFRC's legal officer covering Sri Lanka and the Maldives. And there I dealt with issues around privileges and immunities, around sort of barriers to entry for our organization, bringing in goods, the, the customs issues that arise, getting our international staff in, and all of the myriad and very complex contractual relationships that are necessary to carry out an aid operation over many, many years, still continuing, in fact, in, in the Indian Ocean. So in Sri Lanka, the tsunami, as we know, caused this incredible devastation across 13 countries. Sri Lanka specifically, it claimed over 35,000 lives. It displaced over 850,000 people along the coastline of the entire country. And of course, livelihoods were affected across the country, not just in the coastal zones. So the generous outpouring of support, however, was overwhelming. And of course, this is to be lauded, but at the same time, it was within weeks very apparent that the support itself and its volume actually overwhelmed the systems in place in Sri Lanka to deal with that aid. The unfortunate reality today is that with the number of disasters increasing and the number of actors increasing, these complexities are being seen more and more. In fact, we don't have reliable numbers for the number of disasters before around the 1950s, but more recent numbers will show a, a very clear rising trend in the number of disasters over time. If we take, for example, in the decade of the 1970s, there were around 1,200 reported disasters for the full 10 years. When we look at the last 10 years, there are actually an average of 380 per year across the entire decade. So we can see this amazing trend, which is having consequences for in the entire international response system and challenging us every day. Against this backdrop, the, the number of actors increasing clearly needed when you see the scale of the devastation, but as well increasing the complexity. Um, imagine, for example, in, in Indonesia, following the tsunami, there were about 200 foreign NGOs which showed up in Banda Aceh ready to give their support. Compare that just a couple of years before in India, it was less than half the number when there was a major earthquake in Gujarat. 
then move forward to Haiti. And as I think Paul was making very clear in his presentation, there were more than 400, which are sort of large institutional NGOs which were officially registering. Of course, the number of responders is much, much larger than that when you take into account the state actors which are present take into account um, corporations, private sector actors, and as well sort of purpose-formed organizations, religious groups, individuals which are sending support. And then it becomes very, very apparent how the structure within the country being at the, the sort of entry point for all of this aid is overwhelmed, how complex it is for it to manage in its role in coordinating all of this assistance. So, Taking from that context to the International Federation and how we're working on this, the, the International Federation is, is sort of one of these categories of actors. If you take private sector, governments, NGOs, we in and of ourselves are, are a category which we call the International Federation of Red Cross, Red Cross Societies within the movement family. So you all are familiar, of course, with the American Red Cross, there's the British Red Cross, the Indian Red Cross across the world, in essentially every country there is a Red Cross. There's also another international component, the ICRC, which deals principally with conflict situations. And then our role as the International Federation is in natural disaster response. We've been given the, the task, the role, to study and coordinate among these different actors in disaster response and to study international disaster response frameworks and to help advance and promote better preparedness. This role that we have has been recognized consistently by various international partners in humanitarian response, including through resolutions of the UN General Assembly, in <coughs> resolutions of our own international conference where states, members of, and um, parties to the Geneva Conventions are, are present. They, they have given us this role and they've recognized consistently through different instruments the, the specific role of the, the International Federation and its role to promote this preparedness. So, and in doing so, we've collaborated in the development of several normative instruments in the area, including, for example, the Declaration of Principles for International Humanitarian Relief to the Civilian Population in Disaster Situations, Measures to Expedite International Relief, the Code of Conduct for Red Cross, Red Crescent, and NGOs in Disaster Relief, and the list goes on and on when you take into account the numerous operational guidelines, the coordination that we do with the Interagency Standing Committee, the body which Paul spoke of who coordinates the cluster system. So, taking that, when the Indian Ocean tsunami struck in 2004, the Federation was already very deeply engaged in this monumental study of the existing disaster framework. We were given this specific task um, at that time, back in 2001, by one of our governing bodies, the Council of Delegates, to, to give it a name. And then later, after some work and study, the International Conference, which I mentioned, which includes the, the states, parties, the Geneva Conventions, mandated the International Federation to continue this study of disaster response frameworks internationally. And if I can sort of quote from their decision, to calling upon the International Federation and National Red, Cres Red Crescent Societies to identify and disseminate key legal instruments, lead collaborative efforts to identify gap areas and make recommendations to address them. In doing that, we created this dedicated specific program for international disaster response study called the IDRL program. So for the last almost 10 years, it's been very active in researching, disseminating ex existing law, preparing case studies, following various disasters around the world, and working on preparedness. The body of all of this work, which includes a database of over 500 legal instruments at both the international and the regional level, all of the case studies and various academic articles and so forth are all available on the website. So we've collected this and really put it out there for scholars as well to continue studying with it, working with it to advance. <coughs> but the major finding of all of this study, and I think why we're all gathered here today, recognizing the complexity of what does exist, is in fact there isn't a comprehensive unified legal framework, and that's why we're here talking because it is a really complex situation. Unlike very many other areas of the law, like international human rights law, the law of armed conflict, where there are what we would call, say, flagship treaties in the area, you know, convention on this, international, no, no, no. 
there isn't that for disaster response law. It just doesn't exist. Instead, what we see is a very complex web of treaties in other areas of law which have relevant provisions which might apply to a disaster situation. We see lots and lots of regional instruments. We see lots and lots even more of bilateral agreements between states regulating what their relationship would be in the event of a disaster. We see non-binding guidelines, declarations, resolutions, not not. And I think one really good way to illustrate that, if I can just really quickly, from one of the desk studies that we have at the International Federation, this sort of voluminous text which goes through the whole history of international disaster response law, one of my colleagues put together a, a hypothetical of a disaster. So imagining that there is a country with a nuclear disaster sitting on the edge of Europe, and then a nuclear disaster strikes, and what happens? So if you look at the hypothetical case, just on the question of how assistance would be initiated, you can list more than a dozen instruments which might apply in the situation. Take, for example, General Assembly resolutions, the Nuclear Assistance Convention, Tempore Convention, on, on, on. And depending on which actor you are, depending on which instrument you decide to look at, the rules, in fact, are very, very conflicting. So I think more than complexity, and you can see just sitting here from a very removed perspective, we can see how complicated it might be to understand how these actors are going to come together in a coordinated fashion to carry out the aid. If the disaster is in fact right in front of you and you're trying to sort that out, you can see just how complicated it is and how tempting it is in fact to put aside all of those laws which might apply, regulations, codes, guidelines, whatever they might be, and in fact work on a very ad hoc basis. And this is in fact what we see in practice most of the time. Okay, so just to give a bit more clarity then to, to how that works out in practice, the, the interplay of this very, very uncertain international framework with in most cases a very undeveloped national system when disasters strike is a very a number of common regulatory problems which I think are very easily divided into a couple of categories. So if you take for example barriers to entry which are very common so imagine the customs problems which we've spoken up, the, the entry of goods into the country, the taxes that might apply and sorting through all of that the visas for the actual humanitarian workers which are turning up at the borders ready to help. So barriers to entry problems. Then you have in the next category the legal facilities for actually carrying out the operation. If you're an NGO which turns up at the border of a state ready to help after an earthquake or another similar disaster, you need some sort of legal recognition within the country, recognition of your legal personality to operate in order to open bank accounts, in order to hire local staff, in order to enter into contracts and then enforce them if need be in order to build the houses, distribute water, whatever it is that your programs might be in country. The third category, which really sort of ties together all of these, is the quality and accountability issues which arise, the failures of coordination, the abuses and the corruption that can often follow in a disaster. Recognizing then as well that these, okay, me speaking here from the International Federation perspective sounds very much like issues for the responder, but in fact, these issues are as much issues for the affected state as they are for these responding NGOs or other humanitarian actors. They're very much as well issues for the assisting states, the states that are sending assistance. They're issues for transit states. Oftentimes when you have goods moving across borders, you have transit states caught in the mix who are called upon to clear goods through customs in order that they might reach them, a third state. And understanding how much they're interrelated and how the issues pile on top of one another, the consequences of all of these coming together is of course higher costs for delivering aid, restricted access in a number of cases, and ultimately poorer quality assistance to the communities in need. Okay, so just putting all of that together once we recognize what the picture looks like, what the International Federation has done is to develop together with states, together with other humanitarian actors, a set of guidelines. So 
Of course, there are a number of guidelines which already exist out there, which we've spoke of, but what we've done is put together a comprehensive document of guidelines. And these guidelines, which are set out here, I think there are some copies available for you if you're interested, um, they, they look across the landscape in international humanitarian response, and they, they pull together regulations, rules that already exist, and set out something of an international consensus, a consensus which is accepted by states, has been recognized by states at the international conference, as well in resolutions of the UN General Assembly. It addresses all types of natural disasters. It addresses response in all sectors. And it sets out the, the key principles, the principle of the affected state being at the center with the, the key responsibility for coordinating the disaster response, for meeting the needs of the population. It also sets out very clearly, in, in, in relative detail, the facilities that are necessary for the assisting actors and the conditions upon which they should be provided. Understanding that time is ticking, I will stop there without going into too much more detail, but look forward to the discussion with all of you following. Thanks. Oh, there we are. All right. Thank you very much. It's great to um, come back home. I am a uh, native of DeKalb County, product of Clarkston High School, uh, Emory College, and uh, first um, legal academic I ever uh, met was uh, none other than Harold J. Berman. And in his uh, memory and honor, I thought I would try something uh, along the lines of an integrative approach to uh, the law of disasters, namely disaster and its dimensions. So let me uh, go through. This is a, a much more elaborate presentation, but in the interest of time, I will simply zip. I want you to think of six different dimensions in time and in space where we have to somehow reduce acts of God to the eye of humanity. So I want to get you to remember these, three, uh, these six things in three pairs. Size and surprise, population and potentates, or if you prefer, distribution and democracy, and ultimately time and frames of mind. And we'll go through each of these uh, size and surprise, populations and potentates, times and frames of mind. And ultimately, I'd like to conclude with a few comments about poets and empire, truth and beauty, and um, because I do love natural history, periso perisodactylic prescriptions. Uh, we'll get to that. And I mean, what would be a presentation coming out of Kentucky be without some horses? All right. So here we go. Size matters. So does perception. So let's start with size. As uh, Ms. Moschini just uh, pointed out, there is really no formal legal definition of what constitutes a disaster. Uh, in fact, if you look at American law, you will see in uh, things such as the Stafford Act, there are distinctions. Ah, we think certain things are emergencies, some things are crises. Okay, crisis, disaster, catastrophe, it's just a matter of scale. Now, it's not just size. It's also what it does to our eyes. We think of size as just being scale. It's not. It's also a question of coordination. We have difficulty controlling. We have difficulty connecting as a matter of congruence what happens in one situation with what we can do about it. And in fact, we can't do anything about it. The the problem with these events is that they are complex, they're chaotic, and they have cascading effects, many of which we can't control. So let me make this a little bit more systematic. Uh, a very nice uh, piece of scholarship in this uh, realm is by Cates and Clark called Environmental Surprise. And let me see if I can break this down in a way um, that makes some sense, especially for uh, a legal audience. 
analogies work, as I, uh, I think it all starts with the LSAT. We're all very good with analogies. Oh, let me just make one little side here. If there's a lot of confusing material because I'm just winging stuff from a lot of different areas, including ecology and economics and a little bit of poetry, that's because it's supposed to work that way. You cannot deal with the law of disasters, with the law of anything, but particularly this area, without being willing to pick up any tool and use it, even if only for a moment. So this is why we have to bring in things from uh, allied fields such as uh, environmental uh, science. All right, remember this. Events are to consequences as burden is to loss. You know what burden and loss are. That's directly from Carol Towing. Every first year law student learns about that. Let's think about the misunderstanding of risk and the misunderstanding of the mechanism by which events take place. So let's take a look at the mistakes that we make in the magnitude of certain events and mistakes that we make and the consequences of those events. We, there are events we know to be rare, but we have no idea what the losses are going to be. Very good example, uh, something like Bhopal. We have to mitigate those losses and consequences. Now there are common activities, um, and we don't know what the, the consequences of those are. We painted everything with lead-based paint, it's not many years later, until many years later, that you realize, oh, you have a generation of developmentally disabled people because of their exposure to that lead paint. You have to factor the unthinkable into your analysis ex ante, uh, precisely because you don't know what the consequences are going to be. Then there are problems in understanding the mechanism. We just don't know how things work. So there are many common events that we don't previously detect until it's too late. Legionnaire's disease is the classic example of a complete surprise, not because it was rare. Contamination of that sort happened all the time. But to have that many losses was what exposed our misunderstanding of the underlying um, mechanism for that disease. And then finally, this is a very, uh, the, the biggest problem is when we have multiple consequences and we don't know the, the mechanism at all and you look up and oh, we have somehow uh, created the greatest uh, loss of um, biodiversity in about 65 million years. That's not a good thing, but we didn't know what the problems were until we were too deep. All right. We're now shifting a little bit into um, po populations and potentates, and I want to make sure if you know nothing else from this presentation, there is nothing, no such thing as a natural disaster. All disasters have a sociological component to it. If nothing else, take home this lesson. Things do happen, but they happen to people and they happen to be bad, bad things happen to good people because good people do bad things to each other. So if you think about the factors of human vulnerability, sociological vulnerability, think of the static ex ante problem of susceptibility. Populations are susceptible because they are poor, because they are poorly educated, poorly informed, they are disempowered. There's also the dynamic forward-looking question of resilience, whether they will respond from a bad event. I've always thought of the uh, trying to get this a uh, little bit more um, uh, formal and more quantitative. Focus on one thing. I, uh, there, I do think that there are um, shared measures of ecological and socioeconomic robustness. Uh, the one, if you probably don't know any of these, but the one that should, you should take home is Gini. That is the traditional measure of economic inequality. I don't have the data, I'm just a lawyer, don't actually have time to go there and crunch the numbers. I do know how to crunch numbers, I just have to get them. So if somebody wants to feed them to me, this would be great. But I'd love to have the numbers because I deep down believe this to be true. This is my hypothesis. Resilience correlates very strongly to Gini inequality. To the extent that a society is highly unequal in the distribution of wealth and income,
that will significantly increase its susceptibility and decrease its resilience. Again, nice thought, let's get some data behind it, but it would be great to see uh, Law Among the Ruins proceed that way. Okay, a little bit of poetry now. This, of course, is the famous entry to the gate of hell in um, Dante's Inferno. And the two lines there, uh, right there in the middle that have been highlighted, uh, help us remember the whole point of populations and potentates. Permissiva tra la perduta gente, the forgotten people. Justizia mosse il mio autofatore. Justice move my high maker. Lost populations, perduta gente. Populations of power, autofatore. We have to remember that the sociological dimension of disaster is a relationship between populations of loss and populations of power. All right, which brings us to the question of, well, how would you like your power distributed in order to respond to disasters? This is a deep, ancient discussion. I'm going to use the um, framework of American constitutional history. One of the funnier moments this morning was when I realized that Paul and I were Hamiltonian fans. Probably, and I, you know, as a product of the Deep South, I know this is going to hurt um, many of you out there. The single most overrated, well, person on the winning side of American history will leave aside the three figures carved into the mountain that I could look at every day from Clarkston, Georgia. <laughs> Those guys. Well, forget about them, and I'm glad to come back to my home state at a flag I can actually look at. <laughs> I'll never be governor here. That's all right. the most overrated figure in American history who is not, who didn't have to reapply for citizenship, Thomas Jefferson. Local actors in the Jeffersonian model are supposed to be familiar, accountable, responsive, and resilient, okay? It turns out, where was Mayor Nagin? Where was Governor Babineau during Katrina? Everyone counted on the biggest actors of them all. Not that they're perfect, but ultimately there is going to be a drive in favor of a Hamiltonian view of global, omniscient, incorrigible, awesome, and durable actors. You can disagree with that, that's all right. We'll talk about that a little bit more. Okay, now we need to talk about times and frames of mind. Time, let's start with this. Disasters do exhibit extreme temporal variations. Just thinking about how quickly disasters happen. The flash of a moment, things happen very, very quickly, obviously quicker than we can respond. Others uh, unfold over uh, a geological clock. I always like thinking about climate change and um, um, biodiversity loss as things that take more than the span of human history. This is to say nothing of the other temporal dimension, which is how much time it takes for us to formulate a response, to mitigate, and to remediate, and hopefully prevent these things in the future. All right, here's where a little bit, if you study, um, I don't know why we keep teaching people calculus and we really should be teaching them statistics. For practical applications, it's much, much more useful. This is all in the realm of human misunderstanding of statistics. We think of Gaussian distributions, everything is on a nice bell curve. Education enforces that because we think everything should be on a little, um, on a nice, well-behaving bell curve. The real world doesn't begin to resemble that. What we need to do is think about right skewed distributions uh, with extreme kurtosis, translated into English. What we're talking about is very nasty things that happen rarely, but in a big way. Disasters follow that kind of curve. Think of earthquakes. Most disturbances are low on the Richter scale. The ones that are high, the ones that have big magnitudes behind them, 
correlatively have very low frequency, but when they happen, they are a whopper. Now here's the other problem. The human mind has its own rules of how things should work. The correlation between our own heuristics, how we think the world should work and how the world does work, is extremely poor. So start with better uh, living through chemistry. You know, we like to think that there are good things, that are, they're organic, and then if they're not quite organic, at least they're natural, and then, well, if it's art synthetic or artificial, you kind of go, ugh. Think of the model penal code, right? It gets really bad from things that are just negligent. We didn't really mean it. And we really bring down the criminal hammer if you are purposeful. Well, guess what? We do the same thing with the law of disasters because we have extremely well thought out, elaborate legal systems for preventing war. Okay, that's state on state violence. We have emerging elaborations of law for terror, which is individuals or organizations against states or big populations. We have no idea how to handle disasters because that's just natural. It's not supposed to be something we can control. We have this belief that there are things that we should be able to control. It's called this the mirage of control. We overvalue things. We overvalue causal connections. We, all, we think that there has to be proportionality. We think that there is morality involved in everything. If you're well behaved, bad things don't happen to you. We also misassess things systematically. When I fly home, flew here, I had to call home and say, honey, I made it here alive, when in fact, the most dangerous thing was being driven from Atlanta Airport to the Emory Inn. Okay, we can't actually figure these things out. And I'm making light of it, but it's important because it profoundly affects our inability to formulate decent disaster policy. Those things that we can instantly recall because they're salient in size, they're timed, they're vivid. Oh my God, it's terrible to die that way. We can remember that. This is a problem. We are hardwired in a way that makes us overestimate freakish prob probabilities and underestimate the routine. Okay, well, I'm not going to go over this. There is a, on the IFRC um, uh, website, um, a formula that uh, describes uh, disaster as hazard plus vulnerability divided by capacity. Problem is that those are actually formal mathematical operators. Uh, I'm not persuaded that it works quite that way, but I do see the point of saying that hazard and vulnerability increase the likelihood of disaster, whereas capacity to respond cuts it down. We can talk about disaster as the function of hazards and vulnerability, uh, which are further functions of susceptibility and resilience, which are further affected by time and frame of mind. We'll do that in the paper. Okay, so let me conclude. Talk about poets and empire because unlike poetry, which is the realm of beauty, law has an, a, an affirmative obligation to apply tools toward pursuit of truth. And I talk about horses and zebras for this reason. I've got one minute, so I've got to really focus on this. We imagine many things to be wrong with the world. Those are unicorns. There are things that are bad, but they're really rare. Those are zebras. For once, let's focus on disasters that happen all the time. By and large, focus on the horses, and we'll get it right. Thank you very much. Well, Jim, you are certainly a hard act to follow, and I'm sorry time ran out on the poetry. Uh, enjoyed the foreign language, and we look forward to the poetry of the question time. Uh, thank you very much for uh, putting on this symposium. Uh, Mindy, I applaud your vision in doing so. And uh, the uh, Law Review or Law Journal, I applaud your uh, extraordinary um, commitment and coordination. Um, in putting on um, a show like this. And um, 
that sort of coordination is very, very demanding and challenging on law students, and I appreciate what you have put into it. Um, also, thank you for being here, all of you. Time is precious, and we are here, however, to talk about something that's really important. And it is an area that many of you, and I hope all of you, will contribute in, in your careers in one way or another. Now, um, the topic I have for, before, uh, to discuss about is uh, what can and should the World Bank do in international disaster relief efforts? Um, and I'll divide my remarks as follows. First, I want to clue you in a little bit on the core functions of the World Bank and how those functions relate to disaster relief and recovery efforts. Then we'll talk a little bit about what the World Bank actually does. And then we will critique what it does. Is it, is it approaching things in a meaningful way? Could it do better? Now, in driving here, uh, Brandon asked me if I had my speech ready. And I warned him that um, my approach is, and my interest is more in discussion than in giving speeches, although I will confess that, like all professors, I don't have a great aversion to the sound of my own voice. It's an occupational hazard. But I do very much look forward to your questions and comments, and my goal here is to spur those um, with my own remarks. Uh, so starting then, um, what, is the fun what is the World Bank, what's its function, and what does that function say about what it can or should do in disaster relief efforts? Well, the formal name of the World Bank actually is the International Bank for Reconstruction and Development. Right away, that name, Reconstruction, suggests it has a role in disaster relief. But we can't get rid of the bank from the name. What does that tell us? It tells us that the role will be in the second phase of disaster relief efforts. It's a bank, it finances, and um, the immediate stage is triage, and a bank is not the kind of institution we think for immediate humanitarian triage activities. The Red Cross and other entities are the key, and NGOs are much, much more equipped for that. So we are talking about the role of the World Bank in the second stage, as Paul described it, the second stage of AID approach, which would be reconstruction. Actually, the World Bank was set up after World War II with the primary goal of financing the reconstruction of Europe uh, post its demolition and development became a core function of the World Bank not until the 60s. That's an important part of the story in terms of the World Bank's role um, in international development relief, uh, disaster relief efforts. Um, the International Bank for Reconstruction and Development set, was set up in 1945. Uh, um, its, uh, its goal it was to fund the reconstruction of Europe by making loans. The first borrowers from the bank were France, Belgium, and Japan, actually. Um, and how, where did it get the money for those loans? Not, as some people think, through contributions from member governments. Yes, the World Bank is an international organization. It is um, made up of 180 plus countries. Almost all the countries of the world are members but it is not funded by member contributions. It is actually funded by money it raises on international capital markets by issuing bonds. It is an issuer of bonds of the size of the US government. Its bonds, however, are guaranteed by all of its member countries. And so that, if you like, is the genius of the financing mechanism that makes up the World Bank. It's a self-functioning, self uh, independent financing wheel. It borrows money by issuing bonds. Those bonds are very safe investments because they're guaranteed by all the major economies of the world. That means those bonds can obtain a good interest rate 
and when the proceeds of the bonds reach the World Bank, they are then lent out to developing countries through the process of loans um, at a below market interest rate. That's the World Bank. IDA, the International Development Association, was set up in the 60s as a sister institution to the World Bank to deal with development. It was set up primarily because newly minted uh, independent countries who had just obtained um, independence and broken their colonial bonds could not exist by themselves and could not afford World Bank loans. So something else was needed and the US led the charge to set up a different but sister organization, the International Development Association. It, however, is funded by member country contributions. Uh, their contributions are um, renewed on a replenishment cycle every four years. The International Development Association, however, also was set up to issue loans, just interest-free loans but it was not set up as a grant-making entity. So when we think then of disaster relief, how, do the need, how does the need for disaster relief square with these two institutions that issue loans? Loans do not strike one as, what's, as an appropriate response to the decimation that follows Haiti or uh, the Haiti earthquake or the uh, tsunami or flooding, and uh, these countries need grants. Does the World Bank have a role to play here? Um, and how do you get the World Bank? Uh, uh, oh, let me clarify, when we talk about the World Bank, the, uh, I'm talking about IDA and IBRD together, because IDA, though separately funded through contributions, is actually just a, um, a paper organization. It is completely run by the World Bank. It has no independent staff. It just has an independent source of funds. So here we have IDA and IBRD, together referred to as the World Bank, expected to do something when an international disaster arises or an, a natural disaster of epic proportions hits a developing country. Uh, what should it do? Well, you might think that here we have a structure set up that has a financing infrastructure. IDA is set up to receive contributions from the economic, fr from, from uh, donor type countries. Doesn't it make sense to use IDA to cull more funds from those donors for an international disaster response effort? Can't we have a window in IDA for emergency response? Can't we have a window for grants? Well, it's not so simple because sadly, the World Bank, both IDA and IBRD, have been suffering from a crisis of legitimacy for quite some time. These institutions have fallen far below expectations and they have been vilified by supporters of aid and opponents of aid. Uh, what's the problem? What's, the, what's their beef? Um, well, the, uh, the, the, the beef is as follows. The international bank is seen as being driven by a lending agenda that becomes a sort of a self-fulfilling goal. It, it's seen as um, funding projects that actually haven't been much use to anybody. Um, IDA is sort of, uh, because it provides interest-free loans, but it's seen as, as similar to IBRD. Um, these institutions have, have been seen as bureaucratic and inefficient. Um, they've been seen as promoting a top-down model of development where developing countries, NGOs, and, and civil society are, have, do not have a voice. And the scholarship um, that criticizes these institutions is, is, is enormous. Nagare Woods stands out, uh, Winters and Pincus stand out, Grant and Cohane stand out, uh, Kevin Danaher, um, one of the key proponents of the 50 years is enough um, campaign that, that occurred on the 50th, 50th anniversary of the founding of the bank. 
um, in the face of, and of course then we have on the policy ground or in this, um, the anti-globalization protests and sentiment. In the face of that loss of legitimacy, there is not a lot of support. In fact, there is no support for increasing the budgets of the World Bank to handle disaster relief. There's, the institution has been seen as failing in its core mandate, and there's no appetite to give it more mon money to fail in a new mandate. So what, how do we handle this conundrum? How does the world, the world handle it? Something, we need a disaster relief effort, we have an international financing infrastructure, but we've lost faith in the competence of that structure. What do we do? Something has been done. For the last 20 years, um, there has been a quest on the part of developed countries to find alternatives to, these, to these institutions. And an alternative has been found in the form of setting up a special purpose fund. What does this mean? It means that all of the that major donors will now pool their contributions in a single fund. They will ask the World Bank to serve as trustee of the fund and provide financial management <laughs> services. They will not, however, give the World Bank, whether it's IDA or IB or D, control over the use of those resources. Who has control? The donors themselves have seized control. These special purpose funds began in the 90s, actually with a global fund for environmental, um, the Global Environment Facility, a global fund designed to address global uh, de environmental degradation. That was 94. The next major global fund receiving set up is in 2001 with a global fund for HIV AIDS. Uh, in between 94 and 2001, we have hundreds of funds being set up with the structure of being donor driven and the World Bank's role being sidelined somewhat to that of financial functionary. The question we have to ask ourselves then, is this special purpose fund the answer for disaster relief efforts? How well does it work? There are two ways of answering the question. Structurally, yes, this is the answer, and it has been used. With the um, tsunami, we had a major multi-donor trust fund set up um, under the auspices of the World Bank, but driven by the donors um, who decide on the allocation of funds. Uh, similarly, with Haiti, we have the Haiti Reconstruction Fund, another special purpose fund host, sitting in the World Bank, but driven by the donors. And let's take a quick look at the structure of that fund to see how it advances over putting the money in the coffers of the discretion of the World Bank itself. And then having seen how it advances, we need to critically analyze its risks and challenges. Just very quickly, uh, this is the structure of the Haiti Reconstruction Fund. So here we have um, the donors in control. We think of this as a donor-driven financing mechanism. And they, 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 the govern so you have a, a fund with a governance structure, and this, it'll be called the steering committee or the donor governing body. And who will sit on that? Well, in this case, we have, um, and I should say that the Haiti Reconstruction Fund, in many ways, is the most advanced. Each fund learns from the one that went before it and makes some improvements. So in terms of being a participatory financing mechanism where many voices get heard, Haiti, the Haiti Fund is very advanced. So let's see how this works. We have the donors pool, pledged pool resources to create a fund. The World Bank as trustee will collect that money and put it in an account called the, 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 the Haiti Reconstruction Fund account. So the money is sitting there for use. 
Who gets to decide how it's used? The steering committee of the fund. Who makes up the steering committee? Here we see the Haitian government. Very strong, developing country voice, coupled with the donor governments, a representative from each donor government. They are the voting members on the steering committee. They allocate resources to projects and programs. Who proposes those projects and programs? Haiti. Haiti has set up an interim reconstruction committee. It gets to propose the proposals. Does that mean that the UN and the World Bank, many agencies are out of the picture? No. It just means that we have an imprimatur of a developing country voice. The one that's supposed to be helped is the one that's going to decide what kind of help it wants and makes sense. Sadly, but strangely, that is an innovation in development aid. Um, so Haiti um, gets to vet proposals. It has a recovery plan, which was developed, of course, in consultation with major donors. Um, the secretariat for the, is a, a group in, within the World Bank of, they're basically administrative staff, World Bank employees. They submit the proposals that Haiti recommends to the steering committee. <coughs> the steering committee is made up of voting members, Haiti, and donor governments, and some non-voting members who will throw in their two cents. <laughs> they have expertise. And they here are the World Bank and the partner entities. And the partner entities, UN, that would be UNDP, World Bank, it would be the department that handles uh, operations for Haiti, and then IADB, the Inter-American Development Bank. So they, have, um, they can advise, make suggestions, they don't get a vote, and we have a group, a very representative group of observers a representative from NGO community, local government of Haiti, a representative from the diaspora um, of, of Haitians, and a representative from the private sector. They decide where the money goes. They instruct the World Bank as a financial manager to disperse to the programs they've <laughs> chosen. In this case, the partner entities, as I say, World Bank, UNDP, and IADB, they serve as intermediaries, and they then will make grants to a host of actual recipients who will carry out the programs and projects. One minute left. This is an interesting innovation in collaborative development aid. What are the downsides? There are some. This is a good governance, uh, this, this is a, a good model, but it has some challenges. Number one, accountability. Who is accountable for the use of the funds? If these donors are, if the donor governments and Haiti are making the, 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 uh, the selection, does, do they realize then that they must be answerable to their citizens uh, for the selections they make? Accountability of aid, as indicated by Grant and Cohane, requires that there be standards and that the people, um, um, that the decision makers recognize that the, those standards apply to them and that they be answerable uh, for the decisions they make. Um, with all development aid, accountability is challenged. And here you have the donor governments, when they take this hands-on role, um, they, whereas without that, the World Bank would have been clearly accountable, or at least um, now the donor governments have to share that accountability. Another challenge relates to actually the reputation of the World Bank. Disaster relief is incredibly important, but there are many countries who do rely on the main lending activities of the World Bank for, for major infusions of funds. If the World Bank um, is see, loses its reputation as managing money well, then its bonds will no longer be very attractive investments and the whole sort of cycle of, of money that it borrows and then lends could be adversely affected. So there is a risk um, to the World Bank being closely associated with a fund over which it doesn't have complete control. 
that's, that's um, another challenge. Uh, other challenges still to be decided on, it's great that there's an NGO representative in there. Who gets to choose that NGO? Do we have clear policies and procedures for selecting from the numerous candidates? Um, what policies and procedures do we want these partner entities to apply? Um, procurement rules, as Paul mentioned earlier, are critical. Do we want to uh, lessen those because it's disaster relief recovery, or do we realize that no, this is a high stakes environment and we've got to make sure that however uh, urgent the funding is, it's not dispersed too fast in a way that there are no um, controls on corruption. Lastly, and this is lastly, the, um, the challenge is to lower the transaction costs of creating a special purpose fund. Can, there is no norm so far. Each fund has its own customizations. That's good, but we need to have a model that can be replicated. And those are the challenges. Other things that are going on, yeah, just one other thing that I should mention because it relates to what Paul said. Um, there is an effort to create an international female-like body. Um, donor governments have recently contributed to something called the Global Disaster Reduction and Recovery Facility. Along the lines of what Jim was saying, that facility funds studies um, and, um, for and the development of expertise on disaster prevention. And it also has a small window for grant assistance when disasters occur. So at that international body is another way to go. And um, there is, there, learning has occurred on disaster relief efforts. And that learning now needs to be put into practice. Thank you for your attention. Thank you to our panelists for three very um, informative and interesting presentations. What I'd like to do is just throw out a, a couple of questions for you all, and then we'll open the floor up to questions from the audience. I'm going to throw out a couple of things all together and, and let you all um, tackle them as you wish. If we're, if, we're, if we're looking at the question of what is the overarching legal framework, which is the, the, over, the main subject of this panel, and could there be um, a legal framework that could be created by the international community in the form of a model code, a codification of principles, or something like that, um, that raises a couple of questions for me that I want to throw out to the panelists. What would be the trigger that would actually cause that to come into effect? So. Um, in, in other areas of law, we have a triggering event. Um, obviously, in the law of armed conflict, you have to have an armed conflict. So what constitutes a disaster that would actually trigger this to happen? Um, what role would this play? Would it only address response? Or would it target capacity in advance as well? And um, would it have a role in requiring countries to put in place certain laws? Um, and how much? Uh, influence, coercion, whatever term you want to use, could it play? And that brings in the role of donor countries. If donor countries are controlling the money, what control do they have over the legal frameworks, over the procedures that are in place? As we all know, when you hold the purse strings, you often have a lot of control over what actually happens. So I'll throw those questions out to you guys, um, let you talk about those for a minute, and then we'll open up the floor to questions. Thank you. Yeah, um, thanks for that, Professor Blank. <laughs> Just um, first, it's maybe interesting to think about historically the initiatives that, that have been taken to create a, a comprehensive legal framework and something that is, in fact, internationally binding. And in the studies that we've done, we found a few very notable ones. One, under the League of Nations auspices, there was something called the International Relief Union, which had a relatively short history, but it was at least one institution with central authority for coordinating international disaster response. It was fairly affected for its life, um, but there, for various reasons, partially the demise of the League of Nations itself, it fell apart. Uh, support was withdrawn from the states that were supporting it, and it couldn't function anymore. 
Then, moving forward several decades, in the 1980s, we were speaking of this last evening, there was in fact an effort made to, to have an international convention regulating all aspects of international disaster response. Um, some of you are familiar probably with, the, with UNOCHA, the Office for the Coordination of Humanitarian Affairs. And they, or their predecessor, together in fact with us, launched a study in the 80s to look at the issues, try to come up with something, and moving on from that, OCHA's predecessor at that time, in fact proposed the text of a draft convention to ECOSOC and the Economic and, and Social Affairs body of the United Nations. They considered the convention. Um, there was a lot of debate. They forwarded it on to the second committee of the UN General Assembly, and it effectively died there. So we've, we've seen these measures happen over time. They've come up. There are lots of challenges to them. One primary one, which Paul actually touched on at the, near the end of his presentation, is the idea of state sovereignty and the fact that states have a very strong interest in maintaining and guarding, of course, for very good reason, their sovereignty. And that presents, I think, one of the most formidable challenges to any sort of international framework. That said, the International Law Commission is engaged in, in a large study right now in, in trying, potentially, to draft what might eventually turn out to be a convention. They haven't come out yet and said whether they're aiming for a binding treaty or not. It's, it's a long process in the International Law Commission whenever they work toward the development of a new treaty. I've been sitting for the last year in, in debates in the Sixth Committee, the Legal Committee of the UN General Assembly, listening to member states, interacting with them, hearing their concerns about it, working as well with the Special Rapporteur who's looking at the issue. Um, his various studies, he's presented three reports on the issue. So there, there are certainly efforts underway, but there are numerous, numerous challenges. Um, all right, this is a very interesting pair of questions. So the first question is how you have a triggering mechanism, and the second is uh, assuming that you have some kind of overarching international legal framework, um, what is the uh, extent of that uh, framework's uh, intrusion into um, the uh, national laws of the members? Okay. A um, couple of, I'm just approach this from a couple of analogies. In domestic law, the um, obvious analogy is the Stafford Act, and um, here um, the triggering uh, mechanism is a, a cooperative uh, arrangement between the individual states uh, requesting, please declare an emergency, please declare a disaster, and that triggers different levels of federal assistance, and that's backstopped with the Posse Comitatus Act that says um, the federal intervention into local law enforcement can only go so far, except when we think it should go farther. Um, <laughs> There, there's a, um, an obvious uh, problem with uh, analog uh, using this analogy on the international scale, uh, which is that unlike the individual states of the United States, uh, there hasn't been any formal uh, session of sovereign power to an overarching framework. So that um, kind of top-down model uh, is unlikely to be the obvious uh, maneuver. There's also another huge problem. The reason the Stafford Act works, um, and I'm glad that the Tea Party hasn't decided, you know, in its attacks on the 14th and the 17th Amendment to take a shot at the 16th, because I think if we lost the 16th, the United States itself would be imperiled. Remember what it is. It's the one authorizing income tax. Without a general mechanism for feeding money to the federal government, there's no way to actually give it back as a matter of payouts to uh, states and localities when these things happen. Uh, I think uh, Sophie's uh, presentation puts a real emphasis on how we don't have a stable, meaningful way of transferring big chunks of money uh, in the international dimension. So the domestic uh, model that might be most informative, and I can't believe I'm blanking on the name of this, there's an interstate compact uh, that um, gets states involved with each other, and there is a mechanism for um, Louisiana asking for Alabama, for New York, 
to help at the level of National Guards uh, and other uh, resources at the state level, and that would seem to be the more uh, appropriate domestic um, uh, analogy. Uh, I do want to just go ahead and take a crack at something because I know that I'm speaking in front of Sophie. So I want to uh, put all this in the uh, um, yeah thought one response that uh, or, or one observation that Sophie made in her presentation that warrants um, greater elaboration in uh, this area is um, that there is a broader uh, discomfort um, with global international organizations in the realm of economics. Uh, in fact, probably the single most important set of treaties uh, ever conducted in um, the history of civilization uh, all came down in uh, a few weeks at a hotel in uh, Bretton Woods, New Hampshire. Okay, the Hotel Washington, which um, generated GATT, eventually the World Trade Organization. It generated the International Monetary Fund, and it generated the International Bank for um, uh, Recovery and Development, uh, by now evolved into the World Bank. I could easily imagine um, the, a disaster uh, approach being an insurance fund. So if you think of trade as simply dealing with the rules of competition, then you think of the IMF as, and this is probably the one that uh, we could and should be discussing right now, given the international financial meltdown, how to handle monetary issues and, and regulating the, uh, the international, monetary, uh, international financial services industry. And then the World Bank as being um, big borrowing, uh, perhaps a grant, uh, uh, grant giving uh, entity. What if we imagined a fourth Bretton Woods type institution really the World Insurance Agency. So it would be a world hazard insurance uh, agency along the Bretton Woods model. And instead of having a competition rules, in, in addition to having competition rules, uh, a monetary stabilization fund, and a um, big projects you know, fiscal intervention fund, which is really what uh, the World Bank is, let's go ahead and complete the um, financial services picture here and add a hazard insurance uh, fund. Uh, and if you had that, it would not be at all inappropriate to have insurance type rules on what is the trigger, all right? That's a Stafford Act type uh, legal mechanism. And you would also have to have uh, like the W, and I think by far the WTO is the most um, well-developed international economic system for saying, no, you want to play in the club. You want to be a member of the WTO. You have to do, among other things, accede to TRIPS and come up with protection for intellectual property before we let you join the club. Okay, same thing would apply here. You would have the idea, uh, look, you want to join the European Monetary Union? You have to come up with deficit reduction targets. You have to come up with monetary stability targets on a domestic level before we let you join U Euroland. The same principles would apply except in the realm of hazard insurance. You want to be covered. You want access to the big fund. You have to uh, do things to reduce the moral hazard of participating. You have to have certain reserve requirements. We would talk about it in the terms of the domestic insurance uh, industry, except blasted across uh, the global uh, framework. You can always count on Jim for big ideas, and that is a, a, actually a fascinating one. Uh, have some. Uh, responses to Jim's suggestion, but uh, first just let me uh, tie them into my response um, to our moderator. Um, you see, when you mentioned the word trigger, I thought of it in two dimensions. One, the trigger for creating an international effort or, or the, the means to mobilize an international effort, and then the trigger for actually using that effort once it's created. Um, I happen to think we've already had the trigger for creating the international effort. I mean, how many more disasters do we need? Um, and it's not like the, the world has um, failed to acknowledge that. 
Um, there is, for example, a joint declaration on post-crisis assessment and recovery planning between the UN, the World Bank, and the EU. And uh, that is a declaration of commitment to coordinating knowledge on how to uh, assess, you know, do assessments of uh, need in the immediate aftermath um, so that you don't have multiple different donors all working on the, different, the basis of a different platform. Um, also, the facility I mentioned, the Global Facility for Disaster Reduction and Recovery, was also designed to be something along those lines and something along what you're talking about, Jim, also. It has, it, it, its goal is to fund harmonized risk management uh, approach research um, and the development of comprehen comprehensive programs for disaster risk management. So it's a fund to fund research on those tools and then it would have one window that would be actually money available to send out in grants right away. Um, so efforts are in the offing. Uh, now turning to Jim's suggestion for wor a world hazard, hazard um, insurance agency. It's fascinating. Um, let me tell you what my immediate response is. We do need something like that. The question is, do we want to proliferate the number of international organizations? And as you know, there's a sort of a bias against proliferation of international organizations. Or do we want to retool what we already have to meet that function? And the obvious area I would think to retool and expand is IDA, uh, the International Development Association. I mean, here it is the uh, biggest institution if you like to gather grant funding, but it's lost its, its mojo to some extent. It certainly it, it, it's lost its, its credibility. But could we retool it to restore its credibility? Could it become a more participatory sort of entity? Could it include a, a hazard insurance window along the lines you're discussing? Hmm. Quick response to this. This is a, okay, um, if you, this is, you know, Look, I am a, uh, a, a generalist in American w federal law in particular, and I will say in the last few years, um, I used to believe that repeal of McCarran-Ferguson and, and Glass-Steagall were the best things that we could do. Let me say this here and now, because I don't say this too often, I was wrong. <laughs> it turns out that having structural separation of financial, uh, financial industries uh, may not have been such a bad idea in retrospect because competition rules, monetary stabilization, um, big project lending, and hazard insurance, if you think about it, are very, very different functions. Mm -hmm. And it was true that it takes critical moments in international law, such as the resolution of the Second World War, to enable nation states to come together and agree on something as, um, as epical as the Bretton Woods agreements. Having said that, I would not object, and I don't think it's terribly unworkable, to take an institution such as Ida, which by everyone's uh, admission has lost some of its mojo, and giving it a mandate that is distinct from the original IBRD and saying, look, that's one kind of financial, international financial service, focus on this other kind, and we'll use a McCarran-Ferguson-like firewall to separate uh, what historically the IBRD has done, which is a big project, you know, sort of commercial lending function, yep. from a, uh, a hazard and risk management fund, which really is what we would call in ordinary terms insurance. Let's, um, we have about uh, seven minutes for questions, maybe. Um, so I'll open up the floor to questions. We have microphones up there so that we can get this recorded. Go ahead. Well, I guess that I'm the first one up. Um, I have a question regarding the World Bank. And I guess I was just wondering, for funds that come from IDA or, for example, from the Haiti Reconstruction Fund, are there the same kind of conditionalities that you might see with other funds that would come from 
IBRD. For example, water privatization. If Haiti comes in and the government says, actually, we want to use this funding to strengthen our government capacity and keep it public, are there any conflicts that come up between that and between other um, IBRD and World Bank programs? Thank you for your question. Let, let me ask you to, to make, I want to make sure I understand it. Um, are you wondering whether there can be conflicts between grant assistance and a sort of a lending program that's already in place? Or um, wh wh what's the conflict that you think might arise? The conflict that I'm wondering about is with maybe some of the conditionalities that normally under, you know, an IBRD big program might be there, like I was saying, privatization of water, for example. And if that is in conflict with some of the, the desires or the ways that they want to use funds in the reconstruction fund. And what do you do with that? <laughs> yeah, it, it's an excellent question. Um, I, don't, I don't see them as being in conflict, but there's a huge issue to be resolved. Um, as you, as our speaker clearly knows, and as others may, uh, of you may know, uh, when the World Bank issues a loan, that loan is subject to a number of conditions. And they, can, they break down into a bunch of fiduciary safeguards and a bunch of social safeguards. Fiduciary safeguards are to guard against um, corruption. And for example, it would require that whoever's get, whoever the recipient is has to be subject to a financial assessment to ensure that they can keep audited books, for example. And also, they've got to guarantee, they've got to uh, agree to use World Bank procurement rules, which are very similar to USAID procurement rules, but basically make sure that the president's cousin doesn't get to supply everything um, on a non-competitive basis, um, f all the supplies that are needed to implement a loan. So that's fiduciary safeguards. Social safeguards then cover um, areas like making sure that, uh, loan, uh, that loan proceeds are used in an environmentally sustainable way. Uh, that indigenous people are protected um, and their needs taken into account. They're just two that jump out. There are a couple of social safeguards. The question comes up, uh, when you are dispersing a grant for emergency relief or disaster relief, do you grant exceptions to those safeguards? Um, does the emergency warrant an exception? Because ensuring that those safeguards are observed and, and that the capacity is there to observe them takes time. Um, I think that's a very tricky uh, issue. Um, my inclination is to say as follows, the World Bank is, or the World Bank, Ida, whatever, is in the area of second, phase two um, response, not phase one. And I honestly feel that in phase two, we cannot make exceptions. Um, if funds are found to have been swallowed up uh, through corruption, if indigenous people are left out of the picture, um, the, the um, detriment to um, aid and the reputation of aid and the capacity to mobilize for the next disaster relief effort would just be too great. So I think um, the, the time and the slowness um, are necessary um, evils to protect the greater whole. Thank yeah. you. Sure. Any other questions? Okay, well with that I'd like to thank our panelists.